Hey coaches, we're back. Help support this free resource for athletes and coaches by hitting subscribe. Make sure you like and comment your thoughts or engage with us through our social media platforms. We need you to help continue to grow our brand and it all starts by joining our team of over 500 subscribers. Click the bell to get live notifications of new content coming your way in 2021. On today's episode of Three Down Development, I'm really excited to be joined again by York Offensive Coordinator Tommy Dennison. Uh, you know, we've been talking football here for, you know, better part of an hour or more so now. So excited to get to what we really came here to talk about today, which is the empty passing game. And, um, you know, Coach has been uh, really great, I think, during this time during the pandemic. Tons of stuff he's put out, whether it's with our site or other, um, you know, other avenues of, of learning about football through YouTube and stuff like that. So thanks so much for your time and openness, Coach, and excited to talk some more football today. Yeah, thanks, Jackson. Really excited to to present today on on empty football. It's uh, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, and something that I you know we've had the opportunity to use in a few different places. Uh, and today, I think the chance to to talk to you know your audience about you know a different way of attacking should be a lot of fun. Awesome. So yeah, getting straight to it. As I always start uh, presentations, I love to hear feedback, and would love to hear feedback from from your audience. So. Uh, connect with me, whether it be on Twitter uh, or Instagram, the same uh, uh, username of Tommy Dennison 4, uh, or you can hit me up at my email uh, at York University, tdennison at yorku.ca. Uh, I'm, I'm usually pretty good about getting back. Obviously, things are getting a little bit more busy now as we, we plan for a return to play, uh, and we're really excited about it. You know, this has been uh, an incredible, uh, incredibly difficult year in a lot of ways and a, and a year of growth, right? So, this has been really something uh, and building on, you know, the second time now working with, with you on a presentation. This, is, this has been really great to connect with a lot of different people that maybe we haven't had the chance to connect with in the past and, and just meet new people. And, you know, with COVID and, and being inside, it hasn't been easy to meet new people. So this has been really rewarding that way. So today we're going to talk about uh, why and when is it best to attack out of empty formations. And um, for those of you that were just, you know, kind of picking up on uh, and, and uh, being introduced to, to me as a coach for the first time, I am the offensive coordinator at York University, uh, and I've been such since uh, I think March the 16th of, of last year. So legitimately, uh, pretty much the first day of when everything shut down of COVID, I was very fortunate that the university hired me and, and has, has kept me on through this process because it's really been an opportunity for for us to teach and, and learn and get to know our players. And we're just really excited to get, you know, get back at it. Before that, uh, I was the offensive coordinator at the University of Toronto, uh, where we were, uh, we led the nation in passing uh, in 2019. And we were the seventh ranked offense. Uh, the OUA has recently released uh, uh, some stats on their website. We actually had uh, five of the top 16 passing performances and four of the top eight offensive performances in 2019. So, so really cool stuff and stuff that I'm proud of, I'm proud of those players. I'm proud of what we were able to do there. And a lot of it was out of, uh, out of empty. Um, so, you know, the first slide I have here today is I don't want this to be scary for you, right? Like I know, you know, a lot of coaches that I've spoken to about empty, it's always like, well, what's my safety net? Like if I don't have a running back to hand the ball to, like how, how can I feel comfortable as a coach that I can not only have success, but that I'm not going to turn the football over? Because I think that's the biggest fear out of uh, empty formations is getting sacked and turning the football over. We've seen it as an opportunity to help our offensive line in terms of protection by melting down the box and really helping them understand who it is that they're gonna be blocking. So today we're gonna talk about the plays, a couple base plays that we would run out of empty. We're gonna keep it really simple. And to be honest with you, we really do keep it simple anyways. Uh, for those that have had the chance to uh, watch me talk about football or watch us play football in the past, we really are minimalists. Uh, we don't run a lot of uh, passing concepts or run concepts. You know, we're a zone run team inside and you'll see some more outside zone now that we have some more team speed. You'll see a little draw action, especially with our quarterback. And then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll run some option game, whether it be uh, some, some veer option, inverted veer, speed option or shovel option. Those are really the concepts that we use to attack the box. And we can, you know, we can still run some of the shovel stuff. and. We'll, we'll talk about some of those things, even if they're not in the presentation today, but we can run shovel with either of the two inside receivers uh, going to the three receiver side. So we could take our Y and as you can see on the screen right now and use him on the three receiver side to the field to run shovel, or we could use what we have diagrammed as the T or 
If we have a six receiver, we diagram him as the S and we could run shovel to the boundary and recruit help. So it does give us the opportunity to have plays that are safe. We could run jet sweep out of these formations uh, and we can run a very controlled pass game. So when you see empty, don't think that this is just bombs away and we're chucking balls vertical all day. There will be some vertical passing, but it'll be controlled vertical passing and a lot of quick game. Our goal is that if teams want to bring stunts and twists to their five-man uh, rushes or four-man rushes, that even if they beat us somehow, that it's going to take too long for them to get home. And we'll show some of that a little later with some film. So here's some advantages of empty formation, like some very clear directives of why we do it. One, it provides really clean reads for our quarterback. Now we run uh, a numbers and leverage based offense where we're actually attacking based off of defenders. So it really gives us one clear pre-snap reads, but it also gives us very clear post-snap reads. And the majority of what we talk about today will be post-snap reads inside of our pass game. Uh, and you'll see how clear this is because we're looking for three on three matchups. Okay. And that, that, that gives us that advantage. Inside the box, it's less congestion for our offensive line to work through, whether it be in protection or uh, draw a game, or when we combine the two together, and you'll see a clip of that today, where we ran, uh, and I know everybody uh, loves this, is where you're running RPOs with few draw, and our guys get a little bit further downfield than uh, some, some people may like. Um, it's easier to identify pressure. Uh, when we're in 33 specifically, it really tips the free safety's hand to line up over uh, the number three receiver. And, you know, it's given us, listen, it's not the only thing that we look at. It isn't the ultimate, but it is a strong indicator that there's pressure coming. Um, again, it's not the only thing we're looking for, but it certainly can help us identify pressure and can certainly help us prepare for pressure, even if pressure is not going to come. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. What happens if they show pressure and fall out? What are our answers to that? It allows you to take advantage of the defense if they don't cover down. Well, if they don't cover down, if they want to add in the box and try and get home with six and they do it with the free safety in the field, they're giving us a distinct three on two. We have the capacity because we run a no huddle offense that we could get into a bubble screen situation with literally two words and snap the ball. So combined with our, our snap count, we could literally get the ball up four words from the time we see a three on two. So really, really efficient use of time and language at the line of scrimmage. Uh, and again, there's you know less defenders to make tackles on quarterback runs. So if we're going to run Q draw, we would rather run Q draw in a situation where we're empty than in a situation where we're single back. Because again, although we have that extra lead blocker, uh, that's also another player who can miss an assignment. And and obviously, um, you know we can have a situation where our quarterback gets not only hit but maybe even hurt or knocked out. We talk about data-driven football. I, I really am an advocate for using data and analytics um, in football. This is a, a slide that I've used in other presentations in the past, and it's the exact slide. Uh, this is actually all formations um, and all teams, mostly in the OUA, other than St. Mary's when I was there in 2017. Uh, it's really cool and it's really powerful. This one's not broken down by formation, but I can tell you that it's broken down by competitive advantage or not competitive advantage. So for instance, if you're attacking with a three on three or a four on four or a two on two or a one on one, that's competitive advantage offensively. If you're attacking inside the box with a seven on six, so we count the backs and the defensive personnel in the box, that's a competitive advantage. So we wanna be plus one in the box or, or even numbers uh, on either the field or the boundary to create that competitive advantage. Uh, what this slide shows or this slide shows uh, is a couple things. One. Obviously that, as you can see my mouse here, uh, teams and all teams that attack without a competitive advantage average 4.69 yards per play. And this doesn't affect us. We're just as bad as anybody else when we're not attacking with a competitive advantage. In fact, you can see basically the numbers and the alignment for the numbers in these columns, there's a direct correlation between the athleticism and speed of the team and the uh, yards per play in relation to each other. So. For instance, teams that have a higher number here are strongly more athletic. And I can assure you that uh, I can almost, you can almost guess who the teams are based on the numbers here. And again, similarly here, there's a, a strong correlation. Now, where there is some imbalance is us over here. Uh, this 2.81 is really, really low, but it's because we, you know, we didn't attack without a competitive advantage very often. And some of these numbers, again, 19.82 is very, very high. But again, you can see they didn't attack with a competitive advantage very often at all. So really what this shows is when you attack without a competitive advantage, the number's low. When you attack with a competitive advantage, the number goes from 4.7 to 
to 10.2 basically. Um, and, and again, you can see, this is what's really cool. We attacked with a competitive advantage at Toronto with 67% and at St. Mary's 79%. And the answer to the question people could say is, did you get worse? No, we didn't get worse, but our team was obviously limited by the score of some games at Toronto. You know, obviously our defense had some difficulties. They were younger and there were some struggles in terms of managing scores and managing offensive production on the other side of the ball. So that put us at a, a deficit in some fourth quarters, which tilted like, listen, I, as much as I'm a numbers and leverage guy and attacking with a competitive advantage, if there's a minute 22 in the game and we're down 14, we're also trying to move the ball down the field. So where this number comes in for us, the, uh, the attacking without a competitive advantage, uh, the first situation is obviously anything second and one or shorter where we make the decision to just try and pick up the first down, any quarterback sneaks. And then of course, uh, it could be a situation where a quarterback busts. So let's say we're running smash and he misreads the corner and end up scrambling. So we attack box instead of field. Uh, that number would go in there. Sometimes again, we could give a wrong play call or a wrong suggestion idea to our quarterbacks. So that also can go in there. But then again, also just trailing in certain situations. If we were, you know, a, with the lead in those situations, I would say that number would have been trending a lot closer to 80% like it was at St. Mary's. So just an idea. But when you factor these two things in, look, we had the lowest production when we were when we were attacking without a competitive advantage. And we did, and we had the lowest production when we attacked with a competitive advantage based on you know some some deficits of of, of I would say elite talent. Uh, but yet when you look at the total total overall yards per play, we're number two and number three overall. Uh, and that's because again, when we are taking again, you just kind of look at two buckets, we're putting 80% of our plays or 70% of our plays in Toronto in the competitive advantage bucket and only 20 or 30% of our plays uh, with, in the bucket without a competitive advantage. And you can see obviously our, our competitors in some cases have almost a direct inverse ratio of that. So this is a new slide. And this slide shows only attacking out of empty formations. So here's a cool couple of things I think that we've noticed this. One, we attacked out of empty formations a lot. Uh, so our numbers are really, really, really solid here in terms of understanding what the number is like there's no real there's some statistical significance to these numbers right like they're they're like we were in uh toronto we were in empty probably 40 percent of snaps which is really really heavy for us uh but what you can see is a consistency in the overall number so again similar to the number where uh teams were attacking without a competitive advantage it's very similar at 4.64 and with a competitive advantage very similar at 9.69 um when you look at um our, our success at Toronto, uh, we were at 8.94 yards per play when we were attacking with a competitive advantage. It's more than just the yards per play that gets impacted. More. For instance, when we were attacking with a competitive advantage inside of empty formations, uh, our quarterback was only holding the football for 2.13 seconds uh, and against 3.09 seconds when we were throwing into competitive disadvantages. And overall, the numbers are pretty statistically similar, 2.43 and 1.94. So we were holding the ball a little bit longer than we should have at Toronto in both situations. Um, but at the same time, um, everybody's numbers are significant and, and kind of fall in line the same way. In addition to that, you can see that our quarterback's completion percentage across the board uh, at Toronto, we were at 48% uh, without an advantage and 60% with, 26% at St. Mary's without, 78.72 with. And again, the numbers are, are significant the other way, 37%. Uh, for all teams across the conference in empty formations without, and 72% with. Uh, so it, it really is, you know, I think an eye-opening experience. The last one is interception ratio, because we all want to avoid turnovers. So when teams are attacking in empty without a competitive advantage, they're turning the football over with interceptions at 4.29%. With, with a competitive advantage, they're only turning the football over 1.32% of the time. These numbers are absolutely, well, they're everything to me. Um, and again, it's not just understanding and seeing the number and saying, wow, that's really something. It's what can we do about it, right? So, uh, you know, everything that we've built out of empty, everything that we've built from a 33 formation perspective is trying to get the ball out of our quarterback's hands quickly to efficient targets who can, um, you know, catch the ball and try and do something in that space that they've now created for themselves by having the competitive advantage. Or if we're attacking the box, you know, getting the ball in the quarterback's hands and running downfield so that we can get some box yardage um, in that situation. 
we're going to talk about some key concepts today, uh, but there's not going to be that many. And that's the cool thing about it. Like we don't, you know, we don't need to run 42 plays out of empty to have a ton of success. So we're going to show the two most popular plays that we ran out of empty. And I know that this isn't drawn out of empty, but the concept is we compartmentalize our play call. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, linear play call and what is that? A linear play call being something along the lines of 64 rebel switch ghost, something that has a start, a middle and an end. Our play call isn't like that. It's completely compartmentalized. What that gives us is flexibility, flexibility to change a compartment, two compartments or all three if we really want to. So in this case, I've drawn up one compartment, the boundary, and we've shown you what smash is. But smash could equally be run to the field of the three receivers. Uh, but this is, this is how we call plays. So a field, a box, and a boundary. And then everybody just needs to get the information that they need. Hitches is the other play that we'll run. A couple of things that you know, we'll talk about uh, with hitches is that there are some conversions. There is actually a conversion on smash too. We give the number two. If I go back to it, I'll just quickly briefly talk about it. We give the number two uh, uh, read route where he's reading off the number uh, three defender. So if the number three defender tries to get underneath or if he blitzes, we replace him uh, or we wrap behind him. So his eyes are on the number three defender the whole time. And he's putting our quarterback into a positive situation should they play cut coverage and try and take away uh, the, the intermediate throw underneath. So again, we're reading the corner and we're letting our players, again, we're empowering our players to make decisions on the field and allowing them to put the quarterback in the best situation possible. So when he comes to make that underneath throw, he's placed him in that situation. He's got to read just like the quarterback does. And he's going to make sure that if the quarterback comes to him, he's standing in a place that won't allow for a turnover and will allow for the most yards after catch. Hitches is the same thing. We give our number three receiver the ability to read off the number four defender and our number one receiver to read off the number one defender. So we get press coverage situation. We can convert to a go and we can read all the way up into the third step of the route. So it's really something and really empowering to our athletes to be able to work on that in practice and gives them a competitive advantage over a defender who wants to try and show something late. Right. Look, we know that there's smart defensive coaches and we know that there's defensive coaches that can communicate multiple things. We need to give them tools, our guys tools to combat that the best way that we can and not overcoach it and try and you know come up with the perfect play call, but give tools and abilities for them to adapt, You know, just like a basketball player. Uh, we'll talk about a few protections today. So obviously three man slide is, you know, is a protection I'm sure most people are comfortable with, uh, you know, and turns out into big on big on the other side. Oftentimes you'll see an extra backer in the box, the Mac or the, the will where the Mac would be and the Mac where the empty space is, uh, and the back would be responsible for him in that three man slide, big on big. So that's a concept you'll see us run a lot today on film. You'll also see us run some four man slide and we'll do that in a situation where Obviously, we have a one tech to the, uh, to the side that uh, we're sliding to, or the one tech, I guess, to the side that we're not sliding to. And then he ends up focusing in and we get one on one on the back side of that. Then the question becomes, OK, what do we do if they come with a blitzer? So there's two things that we could do. One, we can give it a double read where if the Mac sinks, we know uh, we can replace them. And, you know, I'm not going to get into how we decide if we're reading off the Mac or the free safety or which way we tag our protections. because I think that's a little bit too much information for one of these. But I think that. Uh, certainly, you know, if this is the case here and we were reading off the Mac, uh, certainly we could uh, obviously have a dual read that that would uh, that would give us the opportunity for our center guard. And, you know, in this particular case, we can either pop or fan. Uh, you know, we you know, if we get a three tech, we feel more comfortable popping to it. If we get a one tech, we feel more comfortable fanning to it just because it's really, really hard for everybody to block one man over versus if we get a one tech, it's a lot easier for for people to get to their assignment. And obviously it's just the tackle and guard now. We have to kind of get on their horse, so to speak. The other way, and this is, you'll see that we did this a lot at Toronto, is we'll actually just bomber and give the guy up. So if you want to bring your Sam backer in, uh, we'll just give up our third receiver to that side and carry on with the route combination otherwise. If you fall out, we'll also fall out. So we have a route combination. Usually it's hitches, but again, uh, it will fall out into that situation. So if the Sam adds in, looks like he's coming, falls out, R Y adds in and then falls into or a T uh, falls into a route. So we're not going to waste space. We're not going to waste a defender. Uh, and this way, if he does come, we can allow our, our old line again in situations where they're athletically limited to not have to worry about dual reads, just focus on the five up front. Uh, again, do we lose something from it? Absolutely. We do, but there's a time and a place for it. And certainly uh, again, if they add in, we really don't end up losing anything. Um, you know, we've created space on that side. Like, as you can see here, if the number three receiver adds in, 
we end up in 23, which is, you know, absolutely one of our most favorite formations. And we've created even more stress now because if the Sam's coming, we've created even more stress on the Mac, who now would have to get under uh, two to the field, right? So it's just not possible. So we've got a true two on two to the field uh, in this particular case. So we do have some film um, to describe, you know, and show some of the concepts. And again, like, really this is about, you know, not being, um, you know, afraid to try these formations because there's no back there. You can get a lot of mileage out of this. Again, the ball comes out quick. You know, there's a lot of specifics and we'll talk to some of the specifics in terms of routes today, like driving our depth to 10 yards, making sure we stick inside with our, you know, our, our, uh, uh, our release and, and, you know, make sure that, you know, our, we're stemming inside the route and then working back down our stem. Like those things are so important and I can't overstate the importance of like, it's not like you could just run a straight line and work through the receiver's outside shoulder because he's going to obviously pin you and jump inside and have an opportunity for, uh, you know, a play just like, you know, when we talk about, you know, run blocking or pulling or any of those concepts, we have rules and responsibilities for our pullers or our alignment or, you know, whoever, you know, whoever's ever asking something to do. Well, receivers, I think the one thing that if I could say is a deficiency that I've seen uh, across all leagues and levels is the release and, you know, making sure that we're controlling the defender, uh, their eyes, their body, uh, where they're looking where they're reacting to, again, based on our rope combinations. And if we don't do that, you know, we're taking our competitive advantage and we're handing it right back to the defense, right? So if, for instance, if our, and, and I actually have a clip today where we have a bust and I'm excited to show that clip because I think it really does expose that a wrong release, you know, everybody's job is so important on the field. Uh, you know, obviously the guy who catches and throws the ball get the most attention but everybody's job on the field is really, really important. And something is, you know, what we can deem as insignificant as not getting to depth on a route, uh, not, you know, sinking too early can be a major, major impact on what happens because a defender can drive on us now or wrong releasing can have a major impact because when we go to throw to the person appropriate to the ball, we can have two people at that point of attack. Now we've also recruited another defender to the point of attack. So we've, you know, at best reduced our ability to get yards after catch. And at worst, maybe even turning the football over, right? Uh, so, you know, those are things that, you know, we have to be cognizant of. So I'm not sure what order these are in anymore, but uh, I know it's a combination of, of hitches and smash. Uh, I believe the first one is hitches. Uh, I can tell you that we're looking for a three-on-three -three concept here. Um, so I'll, I'll just pause it and quickly talk. So you can see that the three-on-three -three is going to be clearly to the boundary side right now. We have three on three over here and we're gonna run all hitches. So for us, we're reading the number two defender. If he sinks, we're gonna to throw to two now. The, if he jumps it, we kick it out to one. One's gonna be making a decision off of the corner. If the corner jumps down on him, he's gonna convert and run the go. And, and again, we don't love his split right now for that because if he were to convert low, uh, he's gonna get run out of bounds. And we had some difficulty with that for sure, Toronto. We wanna to tighten that split down a little bit and widen on the stem. Uh, on the stem. Uh, that said, uh, our number three receiver will be reading the number four defender, who you can see right here. If he blitzes or wraps, we should, or blitzes or walls, we should wrap. Otherwise, he should run his hitch and honor uh, with an inside release off to the number three defender. The quarterback's reading number two. As I said, if he sinks, we throw to two. If he jumps down, we kick it out to one. If he sinks and it gets, and our number three defender walls and it gets cloudy from the inside, the quarterback has the freedom and, and responsibility to now read inside. And now the number three receiver will be reading the number four defender and putting the quarterback into a positive situation. So let's watch it and see how it plays out. So you can see in this situation, and I'll, I'll, I'll slowly roll it back, the number three receiver, and I'll slowly play it so you can see. So we get the really good inside release from the number three receiver that we're craving. And you can see he's got his eyes right now on the number four defender who is right on him. So we should turn into a wrap on the number three. And you can see he does wrap right in behind that number four defender over the hatch mark. Okay, he's occupied the number. So he's not worried about if he's gonna get the ball or not. He's just worrying about making the right decision off number four. Number three right now is making the decision. Uh, I beg your pardon, our number two right now is, is expecting the football, but their number three is deciding on if we're gonna get the football or not. Right now. So you can see right now he sinks. Our guys do a really, like I can't overstate how good, and I know this is Michael Lehman. So Michael, if you're watching this fantastic job, driving to 10 yards, 
Okay, it doesn't sink early, doesn't look back inside. Okay, and now it comes right back down the stem, doesn't drift at all. Okay, and the ball is delivered on the money. Okay, the, the hat sank and he, and, he, uh, uh, and he obviously threw it to two. Now, obviously this looks like it could be, you know, some sort of cut or cover four. I don't really get bogged down on coverages. I just care about what our keys do. Uh, but as you can see right now, you know, with that half sinking like that, oftentimes we can expect the corner to come down low, but he doesn't. And because of that, our corners just, our wide is reading off the corner. So he's going to read and run a hitch right there. So everything is really, really solid for us. Uh, and that's a great play. Uh, we don't get any yards after catch, but we certainly get a really good first down throw. Now we're going to talk about the protection on the backside of it. So it's a 30 front. This really just becomes big on big everywhere. And we just have to identify who the biggest threat is. We know the 38 is a threat over the three receiver side of the boundary right now. So we're responsible for eight and 47 in the box. So really it just becomes these five for these five. Um, and again, there could be dual reads. If somebody were to show and, and, and uh, 47 were to place him, our eyes would just take us from 47 off to the uh, edge player who would be blitzing and we would, we would, uh, we would pop out to that from our guard. Uh, but again, as you can see here for us, let's have a look at if we, if we are solid. Yeah, so right now it looks like we went to a four-man slide and we actually bust. We're fortunate the 47 doesn't blitz here. Uh, again, it's disappointing to see. You know, we work on these things all the time. For the most part, I think, you know, but, but again, it shows like we have to be in a situation where they could defeat us for them to take advantage of that. And they have to, you know, be willing to risk rushing for. And for the most part, listen, we're going to be right 95% of the time. Uh, and I think our kids do a really good job on, I think, the majority of these clips. I'm not afraid to show you a few busts. It's human. It's natural. Uh, it happens. We're not perfect as coaches. Uh, we teach, we teach, we teach. Uh, our kids are trying their absolute best. And sometimes it's the first time they see it. And this was early in the game. Uh, again, and you can see, look, we're just, we're nobody, you know, our center guard on the left, our left side, uh, the right side of the screen right now, look like they're working to eight. And it looks like, you know, our right guard is just working to space. Uh, whereas it should have been our right guard and center working to eight and our center left guard working 47 to any potential rush player off the edge. And if nobody's coming, he can now come help out and, and, and create a kill shot on 90 uh, like he does, but it should have been about a step later. So that's really what we're looking at there. I really liked your point, coach, uh, in terms of like running the hitch. I, I feel like, you know, guys run so many different routes and people often take for granted the hitch. And, you know, it's a simple route on the outset, but there's so many pieces that go into it. You know, you mentioned pushing to 10. Is that a number that, uh, you know, you've done? Like I say, there's younger coaches on here. Is, is like, what's the reasoning behind 10? Um, or is that just, uh, you know, we're trying to get first downs. That's what we need for a first down. So we're going to push to 10. Right now we're 10 because that's the depth for the most part that will ensure that we turn the hips of the defender. Um, you know, I've looked at certain situations where, you know, and, and, and even looked at, can we take it to 12 in situations where we're playing a team that's playing man and off? Uh, you know, I would say there's a lot of things, you know, um, Jackson, that are fluid. Um, and, you know, I think what's really important is that there's a thought process that goes into these things and that it's not like a willy nilly thing. Like, okay, we're just going to do 12 and see how that looks. Or we're going to like, what's the reason behind it. Right. So, for us right now, 10 is giving us an opportunity to turn hips and shoulders and, and, and open up. Um, and that's what we're looking to create. Now, like I said, if there were situations where, you know, we needed to do more to open it up, you know, I would, I would listen to that conversation. And, uh, you know, specifically if it's coming from an athlete or a coach and, and there's value there, yeah, we're open to changing that. And again, I think, again, I think that if that conversation happens and you're getting man and you're getting man off, you know, and you commit to 12, the key concept is again, whether it's 10 or 12 or eight, whatever the number is for you, don't open up before you get there. Because if you open up too early, it does give that defender, even if you're still getting to 10, even if you're still getting, if it ends up being 12, even if you're still getting there, the second, you know, a really good defender who's, who's working off of a receiver, the second he starts opening up, it does give a window of opportunity for that defender to get back in the play. So we really want to make sure, and again, shout out to Michael Lehman in this particular situation, for really doing a great job of sticking his foot in the ground and and, uh, and working back down. So the next play here, I think if I recall, this one might be smash. Uh, but again, it's a similar situation. You can see now the three on three clearly appears to be to the field as opposed to the 
uh, although it looks like we're going to be three on two to the boundary. I beg your pardon. They wall off, and there, there's your three on, on three. And, again, I'm not going to tell you because there's some things here from a defensive coordinator position perspective. I'm not going to tell you whether the quarterback identifies what he identifies, although if somebody wants to ask me the question offline, I might be willing to have that conversation with a high school coach. Uh, but certainly for us right now, we're attacking field. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go over protection in a second. I think we're running smash here. I will tell you that, you know, we run the smash route. We run the corner route at the depth of the deep third defender. And I've talked about this in the past. You know, I, I know a lot of coordinators work their corner route at 10 or 12. Like you're going to see us carry this vertical route right now all the way to the depth of the deep third defender. So he's identifying not only, uh, you know, where the, what the depth of the corner is, but also the half and looking out there and making sure he's, he's gotten to that depth before he, um, before he uh, uh, snaps it to the corner. Uh, for our two outside receivers, they're going to be running hitches at six yards. And our number two receiver is going to be reading off of their number three defender. So if he tries to get underneath them, he can wrap in behind his head. So again, I'll, I'll kind of play this through slowly. Um, and you can see here, like you can see our number three receiver just continues to climb and climb and climb. Like if that number three, uh, that number one defender, the corner, had continued to carry and not step down here, he never would have actually converted to a corner. It would have just been a go route because he's not going to get the football, right? But you could see right now, like that that corner, and because the corner actually, you know, he's reading through the number two to the number three defender because he's got to play deep third in this particular case. Um, so as long as we're carrying vertical, he doesn't have a reason to actually look down inside. You could see that ball is almost halfway. Like if I pause it right here, that ball is almost halfway to the wide out before the corner actually reacts. And I, I want to say that that's because our number three receiver continues to carry vertical in this particular case. Again, our number one receiver does a really nice job of parking out by the sidelines and maintaining you know, his position out there, letting the ball come to him, you know, working just down his stem, but not back to the ball. We don't want to turn inside. Like if you look, there are so many defenders back inside. So you know, we teach this as one of many concepts that we give to our receivers after the catch. But you can see he's working hard inside leverage right now, trying to create that corner, uh, you know, obviously to try and stop him from going straight up into the that alleyway there uh, where he actually has help and now set himself up to take the sidelines. Uh, we don't do a great job of getting back outside, but we do a little later uh, on another clip. But you can see, again, everything, you know, this is, uh, you know, second and first and second and 15, okay? Uh, you know, obviously we get the six yards on the hitch and we're able to get another four or five yards. And at least, you know, we're on the edge of field goal range here. So at least we're giving our coach something to make a decision on, on, you know, third and two uh, or third and one. Uh, again, we're into uh, what looks to be a 30 front here. Again, understanding that 38, we saw a pre-snap. The only person that is going to leave the box is 38 right now. So we, we should be responsible for 47 and eight, and we should be leaving 38 free. Uh, again, whether we have hot or whatever concept on, um, you can make of that what you will. Um, we also could have run bubble screen early. Again, they're just trying to play games here and create confusion. Uh, for us, this just changed 38 and eight's responsibility. Uh, and you can see right now, 64 gets his eyes to come all the way over. Um, in this particular case, it ends up being almost a 40 front where it would be 41 with 47 as the responsibility. Look, this turns into zone protection and our guys obviously are playing on the fly. You can say 64, at least this time, his head and eyes are all the way over, uh, identified off the defender that they're responsible for, and he should be turning back inside for a kill shot right now in 90. And at least in this particular case, it turns into a double off 90, which I can live with. So a solid, solid, solid job from our, our group in this case. So again, it looks like we're going to come back out and run smash again. Uh, it looks like obviously the three on three side would be to the boundary this time. Um, so we should be attacking to the three on three side. Um, you can see, uh, I think this is the first time we get a little bit of a game or a, a, a backer uh, giving us a little bit different edge rush than we had seen. So we'll talk about that when we get to the tight. But again, we're running smash. So where last time it took us a long time to get to the corner route. Now we just have to, again, get to the depth of the deep third defender. He's already there. So now he just has to win. So obviously you can see they do a good job of getting pressure with five. Obviously the game that they brought did bring us a little bit of challenge. We'll see that in a second. 
Uh, but our outside receiver, our number three receiver does a really good job of first outside releasing, now restacking on side that defender to get himself a two-way go. And you can see the number three defender, whether you want to call him the three or the Sam or the Will, whatever you want to call him, um, a nickelback perhaps. Uh, you know, he has a two-way go on him once he restacks him right here. What that also does is give the quarterback flexibility to throw him flat because once that defender gets into chase right now, he can't be worried about looking back over his shoulder because the ball, you know, could, could end up being a touchdown if he looks the wrong way. So he's got to wait for us to react. And once we react, we're now just reacting to the ball. And you can see this ball gets thrown really flat to the sidelines because that's where the comfortable quarterback felt most comfortable because he had to throw it early. Uh, again, you can see this is a much, much different look than the last time we ran smash simply because uh, the deep third defender is no longer positioned at, you know, 24 yards downfield. Now he's only, you know, legitimately six. Yeah, that's, that's a unique feature on the corner road. I think, you know, everyone's offense has smash in it in some capacity. Um, and but that's the first time I've ever heard anyone kind of base the depth of the corner route on that, uh, on that outside third defender. Yeah. We, we felt it made the most sense. Um, you know, if we get pressure, it allows us to shorten our route. Look, we still have to win. We still have to confirm there's, let's, you know, we ask a lot of our receivers uh, with that though, you know, we also give them that ability to separate because of it. Right. So, you know, we're asking them to do a little bit more mentally, but it's going to physically make their job even easier. Uh, right now, obviously, look, we're just working uh, to 42. You know, we knew 50, we knew 59 had to add out right now based on where they were at in the formation. Again, we feel like 33, and you know, 33 is the ultimate fil filter uh, for us. Like if it's things are cloudy, if things are a little bit difficult, it gives us an opportunity uh, you know, to make things a little bit clearer for us, understand where to attack with the football and go from there. Uh, you can see here, they're just playing a little bit of game and bringing an outside rush with 42. Uh, I, I would have much preferred to see us fan to this, um, you know, with it one tech there. It would have been a very easy scoop for the center and the guard could have kicked out and the tackle could have as well. Obviously, for whatever reason, look, we give freedom and flexibility to our players. Uh, I want that to be known. Look, I, you know, we meet a lot with our quarterbacks. And I'll say this to any point. I was talking to a quarterback today that we were recruiting. Um, you know, we, we ask a lot of you. You know, we ask a lot mentally. We ask a lot physically. And we give the same responsibility to our offensive line. And there's a lot of ongoing communication, first between our quarterback and our offensive line and our offensive line and themselves. Um, you know, obviously, there's freedom and first responsibility here. They went to pop. Uh, and he did a decent job. You know, uh, he ends up cutting uh, and going low. Again, I would have preferred him to stay high if he could. Um, you know, obviously, I di he diagnosed that that was the best case scenario. It just makes it feel the quarterback feel a little bit more uncomfortable uh, seeing a whole bunch of white right in his face. Uh, Clay does this phenomenal job of sticking in the pocket here, uh, you know, throwing a dot to uh, uh, Nolan in this particular case. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's smash. It's a little different. It looks a little different than the last time. Super effective. Gets us our, our matchup. And again, uh, you know, even if they had come with a free runner off the edge, and we don't want that, I want to be clear, uh, I don't think they would have got home with it, but the quarterback would have got hit. And that's the great thing about all this empty passing game is the ball should be out of our hands uh, relatively quickly. Uh, next clip here. Again, um, you know, we're in, we're, in, we're in 33 again. Let's just take a quick peek here uh, where things go. So as you can see, we're getting a true three on two to the boundary here. So we definitely want to go here. I know uh, based on what this, this is right now, I know we're running all hitches. Uh, so there is nobody for number three to inside release off of. You can see that that backer has now walked down into a blitzing technique and he's actually going to come and they're going to take their Mac linebacker now and try and get underneath him. He's the number four defender still for us. So he's the defender that we're wrapping off of. So here's a different uh, situation here. Uh, the last time we ran all hitches, you saw the number one receiver uh, come up against a corner that was playing a lot more off than uh, uh, Mr. Ford is here. And you can see that uh, he comes down almost into a cut technique and cut and carry, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you can see that he walls us off and we're just, we're happy with that because we're getting the outside release. And you can see, he, actually I'll give the defenders credit, his head's trying to stick. You can see like, this is the struggle. And this is, well, obviously Will does a really phenomenal job here of, of turning his head the best he can and trying to run through that. And, you know, Ford's head actually is trying to keep back inside and do everything in this possible that's possible for him to keep locked on to see if the ball comes to number two or into that kind of alley there. You can see that our number three is wrapping off the Mac. And you can see right at this position right here, 
that Mac actually pauses and doesn't get underneath the number two receiver who, you know, the quarterback is you know going to feel him get cloudy. If he take another two steps aggressively or earlier, uh, the quarterback would have felt that cloudy from the inside, go inside. And you could see uh, that Nolan on that wrap route would have been coming wide open to the, to the middle of the field. But for us, the read for the quarterback is just number two. He sinks. We throw it to two right now. Again, if it got cloudy from the inside, we'd go inside, but this isn't getting cloudy. Uh, and again, because the half sinks, we don't kick it out. If the half jumps up and takes away number two, that means most likely, uh, you know, the number one receiver uh, would be playing, you know, probably hold or four, uh, and, and we'd be running a hitch on the outside. But no matter what, the wideout is reading off the corner, and in this case, he's turning it into an outside release go. And again, to Ford's credit, he's doing everything in his power, uh, you know, to try and corral him and not let him get up the sidelines while still trying to peek his head inside. So again, in this particular case, it, uh, you know, for us right now, we're just five across the board. Um, it's, uh, it's really as easy as it gets for us. Um, you can see right there, it's five across the board, and then they come with a late game, uh, 47 replacing 37, and you should just see him work his head and eyes outside. Uh, obviously, look, we do not do a great job physically on this play up front uh, at the right guard and right tackle position. You know, mentally, I like where their heads are at. Uh, but obviously our, our tackle oversteps, you know, maybe the tackle thing, you know, look, there's some challenges here and I'm not naive to them. Right. Uh, challenge one is, you know, and you can see the tackle trying to connect. Like we talk about communication all the time. You can see the tackle communicating with the guard right now on a possible edge rusher. So, you know, it's, it's my expectation based on what I'm seeing right now. And again, that's a year and a half ago. So I don't remember specifics, but it looks like the tackle is trying to convey uh, fan responsibilities. And it looks like for whatever reason, uh, if the guard doesn't hear him or doesn't understand, he goes to um, uh, uh, pop responsibilities. And look, we get, I suppose we get a hat on a hat at the end of the day. But again, our pass game is so quick. All we need to do is create a little bit of distortion. Now, you know, of course, if somebody falls down, our quarterback's getting whacked. We, just, we, we expect much better than this. Um, you know, obviously, uh, there was communication going on that I think we could have gotten better. Um, but, you know, listen, we're, we're human. Players are human. Coaches are human. Uh, we make mistakes, we learn from it, we mark it up on film. Uh, this was week one, and it certainly was a learning experience for us. Uh, but again, uh, effort was there. Everybody did just enough. Uh, keep the quarterback upright and clean. And obviously, uh, you know, a 13, 14 year completion. So this is a good clip here um, where we're going to show, you know, bust. Uh, and I think that there's some value in showing some busts. So we talk about the number three receiver. Uh, and again, we get a 30 front here. Uh, we clearly get a three on three into the boundary this time as opposed to the field. Uh, you can see right now the number three defender, you know, they drop into a cover four shell. We still want to inside release that defender because if we don't, we're, we're not maximizing space right now. And you can see this clouds everything. It really makes it difficult. And obviously we don't do a good job up front. And we create a little bit more stress for ourselves here because as you can see, this is an RPO. Uh, where we've tagged uh, hitches in this case uh, with uh, Q draw. So we have created an additional amount of stress on our center because uh, he's one on one with their nose, and that nose is a heck of a player. Uh, that said, our number three receiver does bust and he goes outside on his release of the number three defender, whether you want to call that the Sam rotated or the Will, uh, who's spinning back. Uh, we should be pinning his inside shoulder still, reading off the number four defender on if he should wrap or not. Uh, much like the number three receiver does. So if you look at the top, obviously we run Hitch's mirror here, like textbook up top. Like, first of all, they're all driving to 10 yards. I would say number two does a really good job of releasing inside. I don't like that he drifted to the top of the screen there. So that would be a coaching point there. And certainly number three drifts as well. Although it looks like he's wrapping a little bit more. You know, wrapping, it's so important that we don't drift because if we drift, you know, we can drift right into a free safety. You can dislodge the ball. But we come down here to the bottom of the screen, which is where we should go. And that's where our focus is going to go for the rest of the discussion. Uh, and we're reading off the number two defender who you can see right now first tries to cloud things by, um, you know, coming down hard. And you can see Clay's already made his decision by him coming down. And he's already kicked it out because, you know, he's feeling pressure from the nose. So, you know, the nose did obviously a really nice job of creating pressure on us. And again, we're not in our base pro. We're in RPO right now. So I understand that a little bit more. Uh, but again, as you can see, if he had held the ball a little bit longer, with that half now widening back out, uh, he would have actually thrown to two. Uh, but when he throws it, I agree that that's the decision. 
Uh, but again, because he has to throw it a little early, you can see uh, Will, who's doing a really good job of taking his depth to 10 and certainly doing a good job of sticking his foot in the ground and not drifting. The ball is just not accurate enough right now. But that number three receiver who didn't release inside the number three defender, certainly, you know, if, if play had had a little bit more time, that would have made things really, really cloudy. It would have been forum look for him to look at the number two defender and see two receivers there. So, you know, just have to do a better job, right? Have to stay disciplined to our rules, who we're releasing off of. And just because they do something different doesn't mean we don't have to own the responsibility and still pin that defender. I won't spend as much time on the tight of this one just because we are running Q draw as an RPO to it. And you can see, obviously, uh, our guys are downfield blocking. Uh, and we have a key that tells us when to run Q draw in this particular case. Look, the center needs to do a much better job. And I don't know, it looks like he trips over the guard right there and it kind of loses his footing. So I understand they both kind of trip over their feet, uh, which you know causes even more uh, difficulty for them. But you can see, obviously, for Q draw, if we had, you know, if we had a trip there, you can see that's a really clean look for it. Uh, if our key had taken us there, uh, we did run Q draw against Queens. I think we ripped it off for about 22 or 23 yards. Uh, although I'll say they did a good job downfield and they knocked the ball out of the quarterback's hands, uh, 23 yards downfield. So kudos to Queens for that. Uh, this one's a heartbreaker. So this was uh, with a game of the line against Queens. Again, we get the three on three to the field side this time. Um, this was with the game on the line. We ran smash, and we're going to talk about depth of the deep third defender again. Uh, so you can see we outside release. So really, we're just focused on two concepts, smash and hitches. Uh, we're worked off the depth of the deep third defender. Again, uh, you know, in this case, uh, we get a really – Daniel Diodati does a really nice job of outside releasing here uh, and restacking. You can see he really, really, again, deep third defender hasn't got there yet, still has to win. Restacks him here, gives him a two-way go, and you see how he creates – a two-way go on that number three defender who now has to honor seam route, right? Even though he's got a free to help way, way inside, he knows like, uh oh, I got to get on my horse here, which gives us the ability to snap to the corner and force him into chase. Because we're breaking at the depth of the deep third defender, like if we had broken at 10 or 12 yards here, like a lot of, you know, a lot of team speech, you know, let's see, the line of scrimmage was the 40-yard uh, line. So we've been breaking at the 30. You can see we're just actually getting into our stick right now. And it would have made life a lot because we would have had to flatten our route. It would have made life a lot more, uh, a lot easier for our field corner there. And it would have made life really difficult for our quarterback because he'd be like, is that man? Is that, you know, is that cover three? Like what's going on out there? And even though this is man, this is third and 10 with the game on the line. And that corner knows we run hitches and smash a full bunch. So even though he's playing man, he also knows he wants to help his buddy. And you can see he's trying to drift. He's trying to like honor the, honor the, the, the wide out, he's trying to also drift so that he doesn't give up the corner. And eventually he has to just stand still. He can't drift any longer and the ball's gone. And that gives us the window that we need to get that ball thrown vertical. It's a hell of a ball by play. Uh, you know, obviously this is disappointing that that ball wasn't caught because it's a game winner. Uh, but, you know, we, we focus on, uh, you know, on uh, uh, you know, the, the process all the time with our guys, like doing things the right way. And, you know, Daniel did everything the right way. Of course, you know, nobody wanted to catch the ball more than Daniel. We wanted him to catch the ball. Super proud of him to be in the right spot. We know that our players, you know, now at York, the more and more, you know, we put ourselves in the right position to play, to make a play, we're going to make the play more often than not. And, uh, you know, obviously they're in that position uh, because they've made the play over and over and over in practice and other game situations. Uh, so obviously just waiting for the next opportunity to come. But we did everything right there. And, you know, again, at the end of the day, we, we still have to execute. Uh, but we're, we're, we're trying to hang our hat on the process that gives us an opportunity to make plays, you know, all the time. And you look at there, like, I think one of the things I'm taking from watching this is, again, like, people, I think, when they think about adding something to their offense or, or expanding what they do in their offense, they, they think about all the different things that they can do. And I think people think, okay, if we're going to make it worth it, we need to run, you know, X, Y, and Z out of a formation or whatever. And here we're looking at two simple concepts that I'm sure 90% of offenses run some form of hit hooks. 90% of offenses run some form of smash. You know, you're seeing a variety of different defenses, but the quarterback's read is incredibly similar on every one, right? You've seen 30 front from a couple teams, you know, some pressure. Here's kind of a, a five up, you know, whether it's 40 or 30 personnel, I don't know, but, you know, creative zone blitz, dropping the end out. You see all these different variations of defense to defend two things you feel you do really well. And going out of empty really cleans up the read on where the advantage is for the quarterback. 
Yeah, you nailed it, Jackson. It really does clean things up. You know, like we talked about on that first slide, it really gives, and again, for the O-line, we can talk about the read here as well. Like this is pretty simple for us in terms of five for five. You can see obviously, uh, you know, their, their end or whoever that is, uh, without seeing personnel, I'm not sure, but uh, obviously he tries to wall off anybody that could be coming on crossing routes. And that's okay. You know, it gives us an opportunity. To, obviously, you can see he peeked outside to see if anybody was replacing him. And then, you know, obviously the two of them start working back to the inside to see if there's any help, right? So, uh, again, they do get us with a game really, really late out here to the field, to the boundary side. But, again, you know, we have time to hold the ball for, you know, quite a while before, you know, he gets home and he, he doesn't even have a chance to, to make contact with our quarterback in this particular case. So, um, you know, did enough. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's empty. You know, um, we're, we, you know, we love attacking with empty. Uh, we'll continue to do it. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's an opportunity, as you said, to kind of filter things to, um, keeping things simple, uh, and giving our kids a set of rules. So any questions you have for me, I'd love to answer. Yeah. I think one of the things, you know, that you, you briefly touched on the quarterback RPO, I think as RPOs have become so much more common, um, you know, south of the border, and we were kind of talking before, you know, obviously the last 2020, the, the most modern football right now has been played south of the border just because, you know, in Canada, whether it's at the high school or youth sport or CFL level, we weren't able to have any in the last year. Um, I, I just, in my, in my summer football experience, talking to high school coaches, oftentimes your quarterback's your best athlete, and they may not be a pure quarterback. I think if you know, if we were in a room with all the high school coaches in, in Canada, summer football coaches, and you said, everybody put your hand up, if your quarterback's your best athlete, but he's not a, a trained, schooled necessarily quarterback who's played five or six years of football or five or six years of quarterback, you'd get a lot of hands go up. And I think in, you know, in combination with, you know, being able to take two route concepts that I think everyone runs, maybe not to the, you know, really you look at the option routes and stuff that you guys build in because you have that minimalist approach, you're able to get more out of those concepts than if you're trying to rush to get other things in, um, you know, pairing that with RPO, I think is a really powerful weapon. We did a little bit of it um, uh, my, the last summer football season, I was able to coach in uh, with three, you know, pretty mobile quarterbacks. Um, and I know they all loved it because it was really clean for them, right? It was either, hey, if we're five on five, I'll finish with the ball in the box. If it's not, you know, I got to be able to go to whatever side I feel has. And we weren't even as, as specified as you are with the three on three. We were more so just talking about, okay, what side do I like the space and the leverage that I have in the route concept? And, um, you know, to see that as, as an addition, like I think a lot of people see empty and they go, well, how am I going to run the football? Well, really, that's a super meaningful way to run the ball. I guess, what are your coaching points on? The, I know there's a million ways with QB draw, depending on the front, the fold and all that stuff. I don't think that's as important, you know, as what, like, when do you choose to use the pure pass protection? And when are you trying to build in the RPO as well? Yeah. So again, more blitzers uh, and, and a stronger nose, the more likely we are uh, to do straight pass pro. Uh, unless we get a four man box and then we go straight draw. Uh, we, we added in if, you know, we feel obviously they're not blitzing uh, and one of their, you know, backers is getting into throwing lanes uh, and trying to create that four on three from a five man box. Uh, Queens certainly did that. Uh, they did a really nice job of it. So we had to have an answer. They had a really good nose as well. Uh, we did get some mileage out of it though. Obviously I showed a clip where he got home uh, and, and caused some, you know, uh, some, some pressure. Uh, but I think we ran Q draw in that game uh, successfully three or four times. Uh, we ran a lot of Q draw at Toronto, uh, and we certainly ran even more Q draw uh, at St. Mary's. Um, to your point, you know, uh, our quarterbacks oftentimes now more and more and more are, are, are as, as good of an athlete as you can have, you know, and you look around the conference and there's a lot of, and there has been in the last few years, a lot of really good athletic quarterbacks. So, you know, um, utilizing them, you know, on second and three, second and four, against reduced boxes, second and five, you know, it's opportunities to pick up first downs. Yeah, there's a little bit of risk, but I will say this, you know, if you're throwing into three on four situations on both sides uh, and, and, um, and, and they force the draw by covering down and not giving you anywhere to throw the ball, now you have no escort uh, for your quarterback, right? There's nobody there to protect them three yards downfield because everybody's in pass pro. So 
he now clears through, you know, the D line and all of a sudden he may have a backer or he may have, you know, one of the inside uh, uh, fielder boundary defenders who starts chasing him. You may not feel him and, you know, uh, smack, you know, and now all of a sudden, you know, we're looking at our backup quarterback. And so we believe in, you know, giving him the opportunity, giving our quarterback the opportunity to run Q draw or at least RPO in those, some of those situations, you know, again, to filter out teams that want to, you know, absolutely want to run. Uh, and, you know, listen, the more success we had at Toronto, the more we saw defensive coordinators try and change the look pre-snap. And, you know, we're excited for that. We have answers for that. The better that we can run the football, uh, the less people can do that. You know, we have something to prove, uh, you know, now at York. And, uh, you know, we're excited to be able to run the football a lot more successfully than, than other teams that I've had in the past. I'm really excited for this group. Yeah, it's it's a powerful tool. And I think you see it a lot. Um, I, I talk to some of the defensive guys I know, like in the summer football circuit, they talk about how much quarterbacks are one read to run anyway in high school, right? And And so you might as well clean that one read up it's a lot easier for you to clean that one read up and empower your quarterback to make a decision. Or if he's going to run the ball, it's not the old school of, Oh, you know, he's going to scramble and get into space and run all over the place. It's, it's targeted. Uh, And one thing I think I'd be remiss to mention is I know a lot of high school coaches go, well, we don't run draw, right. We run inside zone or, or power or trap or whatever your run play is. We honestly did it. We would just block inside zone with our guys up front. Cause like you said, the ball's coming out so quick. Um, you know, if we're running those kind of quick game concepts, when we wanted to run the RPO, um, you know, we would just, we would do some fold stuff, but I've seen teams be really successful with just taking their base run play and saying, okay, the quarterback's going to take the football. If, if it's five on five, that's what we're doing. If not, you know, we're getting the ball out, uh, out into space. Um, one question I, I did have is when you drew up the smash concept, I saw the, the number two receiver, who's running, uh, you know, the hook or kind of slant option route, I guess you'd say. Um, what's he reading and what will tell him whether he's going to hook or run the slant? So if the number three defender walls him off, so like they play cut coverage, right? The half's high and they're trying to play, you know, uh, the will. Because, like, again, teams that play against us know we may run smash. So they may try and take that will and aggressively get it. As soon as they see a vertical release from three, wall him off to, to get underneath the number two receiver. So in that case, we just want to extend our route by a couple of yards. You know, we, we, we snap it off at six. We immediately get eyes on, on three. And then we want to create a little bit more vertical separation and wrap right in behind his head uh, and create that opportunity for the quarterback to throw the football team. And I think, you know, to your point, uh, Jackson, you know, we don't run a lot of concepts. Uh, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, because we don't, we get to practice these concepts over and over and over again, whether it be an indie period, uh, or, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, indie, indie tempo period where we're just working and focusing on not maybe just individual skills, but skills inside of our scheme uh, that give us an opportunity to improve, uh, you know, that. And, you know, the really nice thing about it is there's short routes, like whether it be a hitch or, or a shortened hitch to wrap off for our smash or a deeper hitch uh, on, on all hitches. Um, they're not going to take the legs off our guys. Like, you know, we look at more and more now at sports science, right? And, you know, how much running do we want to do in a, in a work week? So these are things that we can give our guys to give them and help them make decisions and, and let them be better on game day while not overrunning them uh, to the point that, you know, they're not going to be as effective or a little slower on game day, uh, you know, which is becoming more and more of a thing. You know, we're seeing sports science and, you know, we certainly at York, we have an incredible uh, strength and conditioning team and strength and conditioning coach and Sam Miles Brain, who, you know, is, is heavily immersed in sports science and, and it's important. And it's important to get our, you know, get our thoroughbreds ready for, for Saturday because, uh, you know, we want them to be able to run as fast as they possibly can on that day. Yeah, that's awesome, Coach. And again, I, I would encourage anybody, um, you know, Coach Coach Tennyson has been super open with with me, whether it's in the show or in, in other conversations outside of what we've done. And if you're interested in what they do on offense, a lot of really interesting ideas that, you know, hopefully we're all watching OUA football this fall um and uh that we'll be seeing from york so coach really appreciate your time and i'd encourage any high school coaches um who are more interested make sure you you get in contact with coach because he's got some really interesting ideas about about the game and um i think his approach can be really versatile across a lot of levels it's not you know you turn on you know tom brady in the super bowl and there's a lot of complicated stuff going on you know there's levels of complexity here but the principles he works with can be applied you know across a variety of of skill level. So really appreciate it coach. And thanks for making the time again tonight. 
Yeah, it was a lot of fun, Jackson. It was great to be with you.